Well, you know, I was going to I was going to say politics till later, but let me <laughs> let, let me let me start with it, does does that have an impact? Do you think on and we can talk about your work, but we can talk about the work in general of artists, meaning that we are living through what many people believe to be a turbulent time. So for you as an artist, does that affect you? Of course, it affects everyone. I mean, does it affect the work? Hard to say. In, in um, unquantifiable or hard to quantify ways, probably. Um, obviously every artist has a different relationship to that kind of content. I probably have less um, direct, I let it, well, I shouldn't say I let, it doesn't, I don't really control it, but I, I think it probably shows up far less in what I do than what some other people do, but it has to, okay. I guess the real question is, will 50 years or 20 years or whatever length of time from now, will people be able to look back and say, oh, that was the art that was made in the era of Donald Trump. I personally doubt it. Mm. Um, but that's not to say it doesn't affect people. And does that have any correlation to what is potentially being done to the, to the arts, to the humanities, to individual art institutions, or are you talking solely on the artists themselves? No, on the artists, I, which are, not that they're unrelated to the institutions, and they of course are into, their fates are interwoven. However, the practice of art is not something which gets reinvented as, as if it were um, a new technology overnight. The, uh, the vocabulary of, of the arts are slower to evolve. So I yeah. don't think it would show up quite in that way. I think the, the um, assumption that we'll be able to read in that sort of content is a, is a kind of um, intentionalist fallacy, actually. And it's, it reminds me of what happened in the beginning of the 80s when um, artists of my generation were more or less accused, which is, sounds like a strange word, but is, is actually the right word, accused of somehow reflecting the values of, of Ronald Reagan, which of course nothing could have been further from the case, which is simply to say you can't read it in. Mm. You, can, you can read it in if you choose to, but it's probably not accurate. And I guess, and then we'll move on, but I, I'm curious as to even the art, but how much of that has to do with your mood? Well, there's a story, perhaps apocryphal, I don't know, wasn't there, that um, uh, one of the worst days of World War II, with the worst uh, losses of life in the, among the, for France, uh, was a day that found Matisse in his studio painting a still life, a beautiful still life. What's the connection? Is it none, you know, partial, causal? I mean, everyone has uh, to live in this world how much your um, awareness of historical forces are, uh, you know, guide your hand. It's just, it's, it's too difficult to say. For me personally, uh, being in a bad mood is something I, I can't really um, afford to let uh, be that deterministic, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. At least not yet. It hasn't been that long. We'll see what happens. Yet, you know? <laughs> Time will tell, yeah. sure. I, I, could, I, could, I could have a very different answer a year from now. The book, as I mentioned, is mm -hmm. How to See. What ultimately did you want to accomplish and, and help readers understand? Well, I think, philosophically speaking, I think art is for everyone, which isn't to say that everyone has to be interested in it or, or, or give it a thought. But it is potentially for everyone, and what that implies is how we talk about it matters. You can talk about it in so many different ways, all equally valid, of course, but some are um, 
yes, yeah, so like some ways of talking about art are, are the way specialists uh, talk to each other. But the way that artists talk to each other about art is, it began to strike me as a different, um, not just a different way of talking, but a whole different relationship to how objects mean in the first place. And the more I kind of tested that theory in the world, the more it actually seemed to be true. The, you know, we all know contemporary art is a kind of baffling subject, partly by intention, partly it's, it's kind of supposed to be not easy. So, in my experience, I would, you know, there'd be openings from this artist or that artist, and at the, at the opening dinner, people would say, what do you think? And there'd be a, the usual kind of muddle of opinions. And then it would you know, be my turn, I would say what I thought, and people would sometimes say, well, you should write that down. So, I, yeah, sure. So after <laughs> that happening a number of times, I thought, well, maybe there's something to that. Um, I really liked the, uh, the challenge of trying to present for a general audience, or anyone who's even passingly interested, uh, a way of talking about art, which is, which is the way artists talk. Uh, and that just didn't seem to be a voice that, that um, was being heard. Why do you think it is important to, to put ourselves in, in the place of the maker? It's partly a matter of uh, proportion. Um, we all grow up in a culture which uh, privileges the individual interpretation. We're all taught that uh, everyone's interpretation of a work of art is equally valid, and it's, it's all a matter of what you bring to it, which is true up to a certain extent, but it's also not very interesting. The interesting thing about art is the, the specificity of it, the, the particular inflection, the style. Everyone has a kind of, everyone can understand the idea of a person's style. Well, art has a style, and in fact, the style is the real core, is, is where the real core of its meaning resides. So to access that style, that meaning and that, that is inside the style, the fastest way is to imagine yourself making it. And by making it doesn't, I don't necessarily mean a, a painting or a traditional art object. It could be some conceptual project or something that involves uh, you know, very, ab very abstract philosophical cons considerations. But if you imagine yourself, um, I mean, it's simply another version of the old adage of put yourself in the other person's shoes. Um, the, uh, you know, art involves a lot of choices. The, one had to choose to do this, and one had to choose to do it in this way. And only by trying to project yourself into that um, process can you start to notice the things which make the work worth looking at in the first place? Does that make sense? It does make sense. When, when it comes to us and it comes to the audience, do we give ourselves enough credit? Do we trust ourselves enough, in your opinion, mm -hmm. to, to look at art? I mean, obviously, it depends on who you are, but yeah. to look at art and to, yeah, and to or, understand it. Or, or too much. No, it's a very good question. It's, you know, one of the, art is one of the many areas in life um, in which we have kind of deferred to um, the institutional um, authority to tell us what's going on, which is, you know, reasonable. But uh, the guiding uh, spirit of the book, the, the essays that I collected to form this book, the guiding spirit was another artist who also functions as a critic named Fairfield Porter, who was writing in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and he died in 79. Fairfield Porter was a, a, a quite accomplished, quite wonderful realist painter. Uh, some people called him the American uh, Vuillard. But he was a wonderful writer, a very um, meticulous describer of works of art. And Fairfield said a wonderful thing, he said that um, often one's, uh, one's um, kind of uh, 
immediate, unvarnished reaction to a work of art, very much like your reaction uh, on meeting a new person, is very much to the point. That is to say, when you meet someone, we all have the incredibly sensitive antenna, which allows us to know within seconds that person's for me, not so much. I want to talk to that person some more, where's the door? And, and you don't have to explain why. It doesn't matter why. What matters is that you have a reaction, you have a feeling. You take them in, don't want to take them in. So since art's made by people, why should art be any different? And Fairfield Point sounds almost like something so simple as to be not worth saying. However, it's pretty radical if you think about it. What Fairfield was suggesting is that works of art can be approached at, like a human personality. And you can, you know more about someone than you think you do if you pause and reflect. Like, why do they do that? Why do they say that? Oh, I know why. I, I just put it together. I know what their issue is. Well, art is no, is, I mean, it's different because it's externalized. It has a formal vocabulary and a grammar and all that kind of stuff. But the point is, the way you in, interact with that grammar is on the same plane, or can be on the same plane, as the way we interact with each other. That was, uh, that was, a, <laughs> you're very good at this. Um, <laughs> it was just a beautiful answer. Uh, but you, you uh, I was waiting for you to use the word conversation. I, is that ultimately what it is, or, or, does it, or does it veer off from that somewhat? You could use that word. Okay. Yeah. 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 You did it much more beautifully. Mm -hmm. You don't need my extra words. I was yeah. just, uh, uh, meaning in a conversation that you look at a piece, it will say something to you. And then, but you can have that back and forth, can't you? Well, I'm not sure, it, I'm not sure the dynamic has that structure. Let me think about it for a second. I've never actually been asked that question so directly. Um, the, Is that good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, just, let's get back to it. OK, all right, that's fine. Yeah, you, can, yeah. you can shelve it till later. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I have, a, I have more. Yeah. Um, w w but when you think about it, mm -hmm. Looking at, as you say, let's, let's just stay with that word conversation, mm -hmm. that the title of the book, How to See. Uh -huh. So when we, we look, that art is telling us initially where to look and bringing us through, right? I mean, especially your work, correct? Well, if it works, if it's any good, it, it does. It, it's, I mean, you could say that all art on a certain level is, is presentational. It's, the whole art is saying, look at this. And so, you know, okay, you have our attention. Now, now what is it that you wanted to say? Now, that's where the hard part comes in. Well, that's sometimes very subtle to tease apart. But, um, wait, what was the question? I lost my thread of thought. Looking at your art of, it, well, it just, I was using your art as an example, but in the idea of how to see, when you look at it, that it is guiding you through. Oh, yeah, I think it's true. I think a work of art, if it's any good, usually tells you what you need to know to have a conversation with it. I mean, that's a little bit of a strange construction, but have a relationship with it. Maybe not always. I don't think that, I mean, this is being a little bit simplistic. You know, art is a, if we say art's a language, which is a cliche, which also happens to be sort of true, there's some people who don't speak the language. There's some people who are tone deaf. There's some people who, I don't speak French. I studied it for years. I still can't speak it worth a damn. It's, um, I don't have a, that language facility. There's a great book about how to listen to music that Aaron Copeland wrote in the 50s. I think it might even be called How to Listen to Music. It's a sort of primer in musicology. Basically, Copeland says, okay, here's, the, here's what music is. Music is there's a, it's a, it's a structure of alternation and repeats. So there's an A, B, A, and an A, B, A, C, and then you know, B, B, A, C, and this is how, and this is this form, and this is that form. And then he says, if you can't follow that, if you can't hear that, you're probably never gonna listen to music. So you can stop right here. And it's, it's kind of a brutal thing to say, but he means it in the best sense. Like he's liberating you from the struggle. Like, you know what, don't worry about it. It's not your thing. So not everyone's <laughs> a visual person. The 
um, surprising thing that I had to adapt to in the art world was realizing how many people in the art world are not particularly visual people. But not, not everyone is, not everyone needs to be, but if you have a sensitivity to it, if it, let's just say it speaks to you, that color speaks to you, that form speaks to you, okay, why? What, what, what is it about it? Um, so when you learn the basics of the grammar, then yes, you can engage, and, and the more you look, the more you speak, the more you are accustomed to using that language and conversing in that language, of course, the more complex your speech becomes. To, use, to beat that metaphor to death. <laughs> <laughs> well, just because I'm curious now, but if, you, if people in the art world are not visual, then what are they? Well, I didn't say the art world in toto. I said it's, you think, Members that, of. You think that everyone would be intensely visually acute. And not necessarily. And not, maybe they don't, not everyone needs to be. There's so many different forms of art today that, I mean, in a sense, retinal, purely retinal art was more or less um, diverted off the main, you know, became a kind of um, subsidiary branch of art a long time ago, uh, more than 100 years ago. So it's not as though people are faking it, and when I say they're not necessarily visual, they might just be very smart, or they might be, you know, it might be a place where all the good parties are, that's fine too. <laughs> when you think of the the artists that you write about in the, in the book, mm -hmm. there there are artists that you celebrate, and there's some that you that you don't. Yeah, I, I made a decision early on since I am an artist. I didn't want to be that person giving out demerits to my to my fellow artists. So I made a decision early on that I would only write about things that I really thought were worth celebrating. The other reason is it takes, for me anyway, it takes a long time to write something descriptive and write something that captures the flavor or the feeling of, of, of looking at a work of art. Put a lot of time into it, a lot of work into it. It's just not worth the time to, to um, you know, go around browbeating someone just because they've made a lousy show. However, there have been a couple of exceptions where um, if, one, if one is to function as a critic at all, you have to show what you don't like to, to as a point of contrast, if nothing else, to um, enhance the, you know, the, the status of the things that you've chosen to celebrate. The other reason is more political. Uh, there's, there is and this is a long conversation, probably not appropriate for right now, but there's um, kind, of been a kind of general grade inflation in all, the, uh, not just maybe not in all the arts, but certainly in the art world, which is uh, itself a complicated phenomenon, is undoubtedly related, at least in part, to the rise of the market and the market's power, the market's power to confer status. So there's, um, there's a great, um, um, kind of handing out of gold stars to, to certain individuals who are not the ones that artists care about. And this is again uh, another, this is another manifestation of that thing I was talking about earlier, that the way artists talk about art is different from the way um, institutional people talk about art. So there are the artists who, who artists admire, and there are the artists who the market admires, and sometimes they're the same person. Often they are, but sometimes they're not. Why would anyone care? What only matters insofar as the hoopla or the hype around certain people is so far from what the artist's perception is that not to call attention to the discrepancy is in a way to perpetuate the, the sense of unreality. That at a certain point, one has to say, no, 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 this is, this is not true. And you know it's not true, and I know it's not true, 
So let's not pretend anymore. And that's, I've done that only a couple of times when I felt like it was called for. I'm sure it wasn't a, a, a pleasant experience for those artists and it's probably not something that a, an artist really wants to go around doing too often. When I've, I did some reviewing and some writing earlier in my career in the 80s, I wrote something negative about another artist, an older artist, quite, quite, quite well known and quite well, quite beloved, but not my taste. I wrote something, I thought, well, who could possibly care? I'm just a kid, this person's very famous, why would anyone even care? Well, I got a call from Bob Rauschenberg, who was very upset. <laughs> Basically, he said, you can't do that. See, you're either one of us or you're one of them. <laughs> An artist cannot criticize other artists in public, not done. And I said, oh, okay, fine, you're, I guess you're right. And I, for years, I believed that, that Bob was right. And, and, but little by little, I asked myself, why not? Why, why should I not? It's, a, it's standard practice in the literary world, obviously, that when we, we all love literary feuds, um, not that I'm trying to feud with anybody, but the, I just think the ability to um, publicly say, no, I don't buy it, not, not so, is occasionally a, um, a, um, a privilege one wants to be able to invoke. Is, is that the thought of, of not buying it, is that, I assume it can be both, but not buying a particular piece of work or the work of that artist? Well, in these, in these cases, it was the whole, the whole program. Well, again, it's, I'm trying to make a distinction. The function of criticism is, in my view, certainly the way I hope to practice it, and the kinds that I like to read, it's not so much um, a uh, um, um, approval meter. It's not a, um, you know, it's not just handing out of stars, like uh, however many stars there are in the, in the rating system. I don't, I don't care about that at all. It's more a question of if we can uncover the way in which this thing has stimulated a, a kind of bogus support structure, we can, we can shed some light on a, a, kind, of, a kind of fallacy. And it's, it, it's, it's not about knocking someone off a pedestal, although that might be a result. In fact, actually, take it back, it's not a result. You actually can't even do that in writing. There's no, if, if someone's on the pedestal, they're on the pedestal for a certain reason, and nothing you write about is gonna change that. But what it can do is it can tell people who are confused or a little bit themselves wondering why they should be, uh, why they should hold this thing in such high esteem, um, helps them to free up their own value judgments and their own sensitivities to that thing. And maybe they'll say, you know, I always knew that was no good, but I, I, everyone else seemed to love it, so you know, who am I to say? Um, and then, of course, there are people who just love it because they love it. They, people love bogus art maybe more than any other kind. That's, that's just the way it's always been. Mm. Uh, something you just said I found interesting in that the, it is common in the literary world. You read the New York Times book review on Sunday and that it, it, is, it is writers writing about writers and, and, and about their work. I'm curious then, because that seems less so, in the art world, is it what you do is is rare, isn't it? Of, of an artist of your stature writing about art and other artists, it is rare. And no one else is crazy enough to take the time that is required to do it. And I, and I don't know why I do. <laughs> do you think it is just time? Well, it's, you have to have the inclination to do it. You have to want to do it. You have to. Have, I mean, all artists I know have brilliant talkers of, and analyzers of other people's work. But the sitting down and committing to the essay form, long or short, is, a, is simply another investment of time. How do you react to, 
to criticism and, and how do you react from criticism from other artists? Well, criticism from other artists is the most interesting. Listen, I'm not Buddha. I don't, I don't claim to be um, immune to negative criticism. And certainly when I was younger, well, it's, I went through different phases when I was much younger. I was so, I don't know if arrogant is the right word, or just oblivious that it actually didn't bother me because I just, well, who cares? That's their opinion. Or, I kind of grew up in the system of belief that held that if the critics hated you, you were doing something right. Because what do they know? <laughs> and then a few years later, you realize that it actually hurts. And then, even more so, what the hell do they know? <laughs> but after a number of more years, I started to realize that negative criticism always contains a, uh, at least a kernel of truth. And you probably have failed in some way. I, I, I began to accept the fact that it's perfectly, uh, not that it's fine, but it, it might happen that you irritate people, your work irritates people. And maybe that's worth you know, looking into. So I always tell students, for example, that you know, the, 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 the natural human reaction to criticism is to just bat it away, like, oh, you don't get it. That, you know, if, you, if you teach in art schools the, the, sh, you know, the one surefire and, in a way, irrefutable response to criticism is it's because you don't get it. If you got it, you wouldn't say that, such stupid things. But that's not really um, an acceptable answer. I always tell students, just try as hard as it is, try not to summarily dismiss criticism because probably um, there's you know, some little bit of truth to it. I mean, I've been called the worst things. I, uh, um, uh, Hilton Kramer called me the worst painter in the world in the, in the New York Times. <laughs> and I, I well, that's not so good. Until I heard my friend Roy Lichtenstein said, oh, he said the same thing about me 20 years before. <laughs> so, so I felt like I was, it was, I was in good company. You know, you have to look at uh, who's who's talking, on whose authority is this, you know, being, being said. There is inside of every critic um, um, a person also. <laughs> the critics are also people, just as artists are. So they went the same thing as, if what I say about art is true, that you can react to it much as you would on meeting a new person, the same thing must be true about criticism, that there, whoever is writing that is, has a personality, and their personality is clashing with yours. So, you, you, but yeah, I try to learn from it. Mm. Do you see what you write as, as criticism, or because it seems to me in the reading of the book and in most of the essays, as an investigation that there is a curiosity on your part to, an investigate to investigate and and look at that work and the artist. So sure, I. I I think that is criticism. That is one of the functions of criticism, is to explain, to understand. I'm trying to understand for myself. I mean, most of the essays started from um, me asking myself, why is that so good? Why does that get to me? Why? Mm. That someone's done something I really admire, could never have done it, would never have thought of it. Why is it so good? And then they try to insert yourself into it, kind of take it apart with a screwdriver, and imagine putting it back together, and then realize, you know, it's even better than I thought, because they had to get from here all the way over to here, and then they make this detour. So I, I think that's what criticism does. It mm. explains and also praises, celebrates. But that's, in a way, well, I don't know. I was going to say that's the byproduct. I don't, I take it back. I think it's a, a kind of intertwined purpose. How to see 
what, what if we don't know what we're looking at? Happens all the time. Then what do we do? <laughs> uh, look for the closest comparison. The closest stylistic comparison. There are certain, well again, let's use the people, let's use the, the human personality uh, idea, let's take, it, let's take it literally. Someone really strikes you as, you just don't know what to make of them. Well, there must be someone you've met that they remind you of or that is in some way similar to them. You look for something that's one, you know, one space to the left or the right or behind, or there's plenty of other things to worry about. I mean, I don't think everyone has to decode everything. They're coming up against a blank wall sensation, which many people have about art, and I have had myself, is not a, necessarily a bad thing. I would just say, you know, try again next week, maybe. It might be, <laughs> seriously, it might be the, uh, I mean, sure, the authors you've read, there's certainly authors I've read, can't crack it. Just too damn hard. A year later, not so hard. I mean, it's, I'm in a different mood, different place. I have more psychic energy. Or someone else helped me find a way into it. Or, more likely, I read something that was in the similar, um, you know, breathed the similar oxygen. So I was more primed to understand, to hear what that writer was, was doing. I'm going to go to the audience and questions, but before I do, where are you now in your work? In my work? My work changes, evolves, uh, kind of roots around a lot. I mean, a lot, I mean, relative to some other people. So I seem to always be in a place of uh, transition which sometimes is exhilarating and sometimes is very uncomfortable, and sometimes both on the same day. <laughs> and that's sort of where, where it's at now. 